Hi, I'm Ann Steckel, and I'm at California State University Chico with the Technology and Learning Program. I'm here today with a tilt session, and we have Dr. Eddie Vela here to talk to us about assessments, specifically in redesigned courses. So welcome. Thanks, and, Ann. Uh, here you go. All right. Um, my name is Eddie Vela. I am a professor in the Department of Psychology at California State University Chico. I also happen to be the Associate Dean uh, of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. Uh, I uh, have most recently also become the campus assessment consultant uh, with respect to e-learning course transformation initiative that, um, um, that's happening on this campus. So I want to talk to you a little bit about assessment and about how that applies to e-learning course transformation. Um, a, a lot of this is coming from the National Center for Academic Transformation. As you can see, it's an independent nonprofit organization, and it's a marvelous resource for, uh, uh, for information about course transformation, supporting documents, and, uh, and frequently asked questions and so forth. What I want to do is take you there very quickly. So any of you who are interested or thinking about uh, course transformations really need to be aware of this site. This site is the perfect place to start. And I just want to point out a couple of things here. Let's see if I can get to it. If you're new to course redesign, there's a, a, a marvelous list of recommended readings. Here's some course redesigns, and so maybe you can see yourself in here someplace. You can see how uh, folks from different universities who are redesigning mathematics courses, for example, statistics, computer science, it goes down, it, it goes down the list here. Um, if you happen to be in psychology, communications, each one of these provide an example of how, for example, California State Polytech University in Pomona has redesigned their general education course and uh, gives you a good starting point. So there are lots of examples in here, and so I do encourage you um, to take a look at that. I wonder if I can, yeah, there we go. Um, another, you, you really just sort of have to go through these links, and, and there's some really interesting links, as I suggested. Here's another one. If you go to this part, you've got this six models for course redesign. This is really the, the way we've organized um, how, how to think about course transformation on this campus with these models. And these give you a global, general, overall sense about, okay, if I'm going to redesign my course, um, what kind of models are there available? And these are actually pretty good models. So, so let's go on. The question is, why do assessment? And uh, it's pretty simple, really. I mean, the goal is to ultimately try to improve student learning. And um, this is assessment. We, we already do assessment. We give student grades. We assess their performance in classes. But a formal assessment with respect to understanding student performance has more to do with identifying very specific student knowledge, skills, and abilities, and being able to observe their behavior in such a way that informs us so that we can make curricular changes or um, 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 provide some rationale for why we're doing is actually working. It's a way to gather data. If you look at the net and you, and you search for assessment, uh, what you're going to see are hundreds, maybe thousands of sites and opinions. I selected this one. Um, from the AAHE Bulletin. It was dated 1995. It's still relevant. It's a lot of words here, but uh, there are some things I want to point out with respect to how to think about assessment. Um, it's important to note that if you're going to be doing assessment and, and you want it to be a useful activity, it needs to be an ongoing process, it's not a one-shot deal. And an ongoing process means it's something you pay attention to every semester, every year, and you somehow have a formal mechanism by which you're able to instantiate the process. That formal mechanism in some way needs to be systematic. And so not only is it an ongoing process, but it's a systematic process. The way I think about it is in higher education, uh, faculty are scholars in their respective fields. What they do is uh, turn their powers of observation, analytic assessment, critical thinking to the disciplines that, they, um, that they're interested in. Higher education spends a lot of time in the classroom and teaching students. 
why not use those same powers of observations, critical analysis, synthesis, and interpretation, trying to make better sense of what we do on a daily basis, which is education. And so it's an ongoing process. It's systematic. And the whole idea is that we want to do this in a way that it's going to improve student performance, student learning. For me, one of the things that has come out of this uh, in my own interactions with assessment is that it focuses our collective attention as a department, as a college, as a university, on student learning. Often, historically, we classes are isolated. There's an assessment of what you do in your classes that isn't shared widely among people, and there are assumptions in departments about what student skills or knowledge areas are being covered that often are simply assumptions. When you're doing assessment and you're doing it in context of a, of a larger sense of what is our unit trying to get at? What are the series of goals and student learning objectives that our department or our college are really trying to address? And when you bring this into a group meeting, a faculty discussion, um, a wider academic community, you train several eyes on this and in my experience, what ends up happening quite often is people are surprised to discover things that they didn't know were going on or that things weren't being covered in the way that they thought they were. Student learning is a, is a systematic process, and it's systemic, which means there are relationships among student goals across courses, across departments, across colleges. And so doing assessment isn't an isolated activity. It should be a collective. And what comes from that is a gestalt, a global view of what's going on that provides insights that I'm not sure you can gather any other way. Um, almost all universities have some sort of, of site dedicated to assessment activities uh, and their philosophy regarding assessment activities. Assisium Chico is, is no different. And, um, um, you can go to the assessment site uh, and, and see all the marvelous resources we have. Um, it's, um, it's a site in progress, of course. Um, but I pulled out this quote uh, that you can see on the site. Uh, assessment is a process to ensure CSU Chico continues to create and maintain high quality learning environments. This happens to be our number one strategic priority. And assessment is designed to address systematically, logically, coherently that number one uh, strategic priority. It's not just words. Um, it's, um, uh, it's a philosophy that, that drives and compels us, and assessment is a way to put some meat on, on the concepts and provide a way to be able to um, address this uh, strategic priority um, in a coherent and logical fashion. Bear with me here as I go through the slides. Um, as, as anybody who's watching this realizes, um, assessment has been around for a while, and in the past few years has really been a push for formal assessment um, in higher education. Um, and so in taking a look at e-learning course transformation, assessment has a vital role. As you are thinking about redesigning your course, um, one of the things to always keep in mind is, okay, as I'm doing this, where are logical places that I can do assessment? And, and what is it that I'm going to assess, and how often do I need to assess these things? Summer of 2009 was the, was the um, first uh, uh, university, CSU Chico university-wide um, initiative trying to bring assessment and e-learning course transformations together in a three-week workshop series. Um, it was um, a successful project. Um, I have just come back from an NCAD conference and was delighted to discover that CSU Chico, with respect to instantiating assessment and, and relating it to e-learning course transformation, is on the cutting edge. We, and this is in large part due to the explicit support of e-learning transformation and assessment by our provost. Without that explicit support from the top down, um, uh, the success of a system-wide assessment approach to, well, to student learning and e-course transformation just is probably not going to work. And that's one of the things that came across loud and clear 
nationally, at CSU Chico, is on the cutting edge. We're doing this, and, uh, and we're actually now um, informing practices from other universities, which I feel pretty proud. Uh, this picture, by the way, if you can see it, um, is an image from um, the eLearning Academy uh, this summer. Uh, where we had uh, teams of faculty come in and take a look at and think about and begin transforming their their courses. All right, um, how to think about this? When you think about um, um, assessment in the context of e-learning course transformation, um, it, maybe I should back up. What does e-learning course transformation mean? Well, in general, what we're talking about is looking at novel and interesting ways to transform your course, making use of technology uh, um, in a way that makes sense and it's not gratuitous. It's an actual use of the tools um, um, that enhances your ability to uh, improve student learning um, and do so in a way that perhaps is more efficient. All right. Uh, with respect to two kinds of assessment or evaluation questions you can, that can be asked uh, in an e-learning transformation, one is it has to do with the implementation question. Once you redesign a course or some feature of the course, the question is, well, okay, you have some ideas about how it's going to work. Did it work that way? How well did it work? And so uh, how successful were you, uh, were you with respect to incorporating clickers, if that's something that you wanted to do? This is why it's really important, and this is built in into how we think about course transformation on this campus is, is faculty are required, or not required, but certainly are encouraged to do pilot testing of a central feature of the course transformation before there's a full rollout of, of the transformed course. And so asking uh, students with respect to their attitudes about some of the technology, some of the activities that's been done, um, that's, that's very important because student motivation is going to be affected by how they think about the course and their personal experiences with the sorts of activities and the, and the methods by which you allow students to interact with those activities. Pilot testing is important. I think this is true for probably any discipline. Um, the next question is, um, is one that has to do with um, assessing the outcomes, and this is formal assessment. Did the student outcomes you're looking to address, were they met? And, and how did those student outcomes fare uh, in comparison to the traditional, the pre-transformed uh, course format? And so this is where formal assessment comes in. So the question here then is, what should we be measuring when we're measuring formal assessment? Obviously, we need to be measuring student learning outcomes. Student learning outcomes are are operationalized um, statements about what we expect students to learn in such a way that we are guided about how to go about measuring those student learning outcomes. And so they need to be operationalized well enough um, um, for you to be able to measure them and identify what courses perhaps are better courses than others where you can do the assessment of those student learning outcomes. Of course, you have to develop student learning outcomes and there's a whole process associated with that, um, uh, both within a course and looking at student outcomes as they manifest across courses within a program. Um, so that's one of the things, that's probably the primary thing people are going to be working on. Um, another thing to think about with respect to what is it we might assess are key course component completion rates. What, what exactly does that mean? Um, there may be specific concepts that are really key to what you hope students will leave your program understanding. And, and um, you can, in addition to looking at other student learning outcomes, take a look at changes in the rates by which students um, show some degree of mastery on those key components. And you can simply do a completion rate or a mastery rate if you're interested um, in, in, for example, um, a course that I teach that's being assessed, uh, understanding um, a particular model, it's a, a corollary discharge model about how vision works. And so I'm interested in other kinds of things, but I'm really interested in that in that course because that's key to understanding 
some other features of the course. I look specifically at that item in terms of every semester, how many students are getting that one item? And if I see improvements as a result of my redesign efforts, um, it, it's useful for me because I understand that that's key to understanding subsequent ideas. And so that's what that means. Take a look at key course component completion rates as something that you can consider doing in addition to formally assessing student learning outcomes. Something that the uh, National Center for Academic Transformation also suggests we look at and keep track of as a gestalt, as a global measure of student learning, uh, is what's called the DFW rate. Within a course, how many Ds are given out, how many Fs are given out, and how many withdrawals? Um, you might be thinking, well, that's pretty easy to manipulate. I just make my course easier. I change my criteria. Sure, you can do that. Um, but that's not probably going to be particularly useful in coming to understand, are my students really getting this? And so, of course, this relies on your own academic integrity, but um, if you take a look at, D, uh, at the number of Ds, Fs, and Ws, that can give you some idea as to, uh, as to how successful the course is, how appealing it is, and how successful, from a global point of view, um, your redesign is. Um, this is especially useful for courses who have, for example, minimum C or minimum C minus requirements in order to move on in the major. And so this gives you an initial gestalt global idea about success. Um, something that uh, people often don't measure but that is very useful uh, are student attitudes. Did, were the redesign efforts in your class, did they have the effect of of um, engaging students such that they feel better about learning the material? Were there ways that they can engage with it that, um, that um, made them want to learn the material? If, if students feel like they have some confidence in the material, you may reduce simply by that variable alone the withdrawal rate. Uh, students will often withdraw um, or try to withdraw when they realize that they're just not getting it. And, and they don't have any confidence that they're going to get it. So confidence and ability to learn is one of many possible variables. You can get student attitudes about course design. How did you like those clickers? Did it make you want to come to class? What about the online discussion that we posted that I had available to you? Was that useful? Um, what about when I videotaped or, or I, uh, I recorded my lectures and provided them for you as an archive? Did you use it? Was that useful for you? Did you? So that's very useful to get that kind of stuff. And you can get that kind of feedback within the learning management system, just as a survey, very easy to put together survey tool. And, uh, and, and our students, we, we think of our students as technologically savvy, and they are, um, but they tend to be often isolated in the technological uh, uh, savviness. They're really good at certain things, and maybe not so good at other things. We can't assume that a student, simply because they're the millennial student or the digital student or whatever phrase we want to apply, means that they're somehow ubiquitously capable of interacting with all the technologies that are available in the learning management system. Ask them about it. And they, in fact, might give you feedback about a particular technology tool that, that was useful, but boy, it sure would have been better if you did this, that, or the other. And uh, that can be very useful in, in sort of fine-tuning your course. All right. As recommended by uh, the National Center for Academic Transformation with respect to how to assess your redesign course, um, you really can't do – it's virtually impossible to do a true experimental design here. Uh, you aren't randomly assigning people to different conditions, students self-select. So you have, at best, some kind of quasi-experimental design. And it's pretty simple, actually. The way to think about this is with respect to comparing student performance, student learning outcomes, the FW rate, student surveys, for example, um, um, uh, with, with respect to how students learn in the traditional format compared to the transformed format. What's very common is a sequential semester comparison approach. And uh, basically what this involves is you have data, hopefully, uh, from prior semesters about student learning outcomes and so forth. And what you can do is you can, you can um, um, compare that, those prior semester data to the current semester data with the redesign. That's the sequential comparison methodology. Ideally, from an experimental point of view, because there's so many potential variables that, that could change from a semester to semester, 
uh, that are out of your control, of course that's true within a semester, but probably also, is uh, what's called simultaneous comparison. Here, uh, uh, the idea is that the redesigned course is rolled out at the same time the traditional format course uh, is, is maintained. And if you can have the same instructor, that's even better. Um, the more things you can match up, obviously, the better. But at the very least, if you can do a simultaneous comparison, the very same semester of a traditional format versus a redesigned format, you're in a, probably the best position you're going to be in to be able to make um, uh, inferences about uh, what the change has done in a way that's reliable. So you've got the sequential semester comparisons and the simultaneous comparison methodology. Okay, assessment methods and data. Um, again, um, we, we assess our students all the time. We give them exams, we assign them grades. Um, and it, it, that's more of a, uh, a, a, you can think of it more of as a summative assessment in terms of evaluating where they are and what kind of grades, and less so as a formative, certainly not formative in terms of informing your practice about what you can change or do better um, or go back to doing uh, with respect to successful student learning outcomes. And so this has to do with not looking at overall grades per se, you can look at that, but looking specifically at student knowledge, skills, and performance uh, on student learning outcomes that you've operationalized pre uh, uh, prior. Um, and so um, probably the best way to do this, uh, if you can possibly do it, is with embedded assessments. Most courses already have assignments. There are exams that people use. If there are specific learning outcomes that you are looking to assess, look at the course as it currently exists and see are there assignments, are there components within an exam, for example, that can be used to assess student learning of that particular uh, student learning outcome. Uh, what you want to make sure that if you do that is that, uh, especially when you, if you're comparing traditional to the to the transformed courses, the exams should be matched and the assignments should be matched. Uh, you want the same kind of things. Uh, I know some uh, uh, e-learning transformed courses do so with respect to a common final. There are some variations within the course, but everybody has the same final, and there are specific subcomponents uh, of the final that people are looking at to determine whether or not there was the redesign was successful. Um, another very common technique uh, are pre and post tests. Um, sometimes these are embedded, sometimes they're not, but they really are very useful and it's very straightforward. Uh, lots of folks are doing that. This is something we do uh, ubiquitously in the uh, Department of Psychology, CC Chico, um, um, in, in many of our courses, giving students a pretest and then a post-test, usually some subset of what we call the big ideas, 10, 15, 20 questions of big ideas. And um, uh, people do it different ways. One of the ways I do it is the very first day of class, the very first day of class, I start out, I introduce myself and say, by the way, um, we're going to start the class with a little exam. And so I present the students um, with the questions, they answer them. These are, these are key ideas that are going to be coming in the course. And I get an assessment, an initial idea of where they're at. It serves two purposes. It gives me a base rate by which I can evaluate how much learning, another way that I can evaluate how much learning that they've accomplished um, because I can compare that uh, to the post-test. It also gives me a way to get a sense about where my students are right from the beginning of the class. If I'm finding a lot of people seem to be getting this particular concept, they already got it for some reason, I might change how much time I devote to that concept when I finally get to that in that semester. So the pre and post-test, um, methodology is, is very good. Um, another way to think about this is with respect to third-party assessments. Uh, this, is, this is not untypical for programs that have um, professional or external accreditation requirements or exams, uh, whether, for example, the CBEST um, or other kinds of third-party exams that, that if you are required by an external accrediting body to meet students, students to meet and address certain student learning outcomes, um, their professional exams often cover that, and you can use that as part of your assessment as well. Um, 
Um, the other thing uh, to keep in mind is you need to track student performance over time, and then uh, to reiterate, attitude surveys are really important. Getting student attitudes about the course and about the learning materials and the things that you had them do is very useful. Um, this turned out, just anecdotally, to be useful feedback to uh, one of the course redesign um, um, faculty this last year who I was recently speaking with him and what he discovered when his redesign was that the student attitudes had shifted that in a way that was unexpected. Uh, this course was a, it was a course where students spent part of their time on the web uh, doing, uh, doing assignments using a third-party software. Uh, uh, most introductory textbooks have really marvelous materials available and they were using that for the, uh, for the uh, uh, web-based assignment. Um, this is called a supplemental model, by the way. They were supplementing one of the in-class uh, meetings with uh, a web uh, uh, series of assignments. Um, just as an aside, what that basically allowed them to do was to, was to increase the enrollment of the class, but only half the class met face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. The other half uh, would be um, doing web assignments, and they'd switch on a Tuesday and Thursday. So the class was twice as big, but the class size that the faculty person was facing was the same size. They would just uh, they cut those off. Uh, they, uh, half the assignments were web-based. Anyway, the point is, is what the discovery was, and this was from survey, was that, well, you know, all the fun stuff was on the web. And then we come to lecture, and that wasn't a lot of fun because the lecture was based on stuff that they really weren't getting, and so the instructor wanted to emphasize more time. No one predicted this. We didn't know that, we, and they wouldn't have known that had they not asked for student responses about how did you like this format, what was right with it, what was wrong with it. That was very useful, and that's going to cause them to do some changes. Remember, I suggested that student, uh, students are learning that assessment is an ongoing process, and this is an example of why it needs to be an ongoing process. Um, all right, some issues affecting project success. Well. These are these are sort of no-brainers. Resources. Um, you need time, and uh, it because it does take time. Um, that's probably one of the things in our first cohort of faculty we worked with that was um, um, an aha experience for many of them. They came into this thinking, well, okay, but we'll try this. I think this is pretty good. We have some. Here's a chance for us to do some interesting things. And then they realized that the smallest change took twice as long as they thought it was going to take. In some cases, five times as long, depending on the situation. So this is important. By the way, um, we've addressed this in our e-learning academy. We've built in the time, and um, and uh, we've done it in such a way that that well, we foreshadowed that this would be an issue. But it nevertheless uh, uh, continued to be an issue. Um, the other uh, resource issue is tech support. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of technology related issues associated with the learning management system that faculty need help with. Are the technology people available to be able to help you do this? On this campus, the answer is absolutely yes. And they're a marvelous team of people, and they're ready to go to help. So, um, resources, your time and support, is going to be an issue that affects how successful your project is. Another one is is once you actually implement the project is an interesting uh, phenomenon referred to as course drift um, in terms of assessing uh, project success. Course drift is a fancy way of saying, all right, we've got three, we've got four sections that have been redesigned. Each section is being taught by the different instructor. And what you end up looking when you look at the data is there's differential rates of success across the section. Well, what's going on with that? Well, part of what's going on is that the faculty had different expectations about student performance or about how much time they had to put into it. Perhaps some faculty emphasized one topic more than another. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's simply something that you have to take into account is that how the course instantiates across instructors will vary. And if it varies too much, you get a lot of drift. Um, well, that's useful feedback, uh, but that's something to take into account. There's also changes in student characteristics, not only in terms of who the students are, um, uh, uh, in terms of age or class standing, but what time of the day they're taking the class. If you have uh, some sections in the morning, some sections in the afternoon, 
that's going to have an effect. And you have to take those into account in, in, in assessing the success of your transformed course. And I, I added this other bullet, others discovered in the process of transformation. It, it has become clear that no matter how much you try to prepare for all eventualities uh, in the transformed uh, uh, design, you can't prepare for all eventualities because you can't think of them all. The, you, you realize as you do it, but that's okay. And that's something you have to be prepared for. The things are going to pop up that never occur to you. And um, um, that's in part why we hope people who go through this will become mentors down the road because they can then inform uh, subsequent uh, cohorts with respect to their experiences. And so we have a snowball effect, a positive one. Um, all right. Some final thoughts. As you're thinking about course transformation, um, focus primarily on student learning and what you can do to, to, uh, to enhance student learning. That's really the core thing. Um, as you're making, as you are assessing the transform course, think about comparative advantages, comparing to the traditional course, what advantages occurred and what disadvantages may have occurred in your transform course. What you hope is that you transformed in such a way that you Enhance student engagement, student motivation, student learning. Um, at the very least, you want to make sure your redesign does no harm. Uh, caveat, sometimes a redesign doesn't work. It just doesn't work. But like a hypothesis that's not supported, it still tells you something. And so when it doesn't work, and if you're doing proper assessment, you have some idea about why it doesn't work. And so Redesign should do no harm, at least in the long run. Initially, after, if for the first uh, implementation, there might be some glitches. There probably will be. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is if you are assessing in such a way that the information you're gathering tells you little or nothing about what you need to do to improve, you can't close the loop. You need to be – what's the point of assessment? Yes, it's to improve student learning, but you're not going to be able to do that unless the information that you get is telling you something about what you need to change or what you need to do. So close the loop. Finally, um, keep it simple. Uh, like many masters or dissertation theses, you have big ideas about what you want to do that overwhelm you. You want to keep it simple, keep your transformations fairly focused. Um, it doesn't need to be rocket science. It just needs to be thoughtful and, and uh, systematic. Try to keep it simple. A small transformation you will find will be like a dry sponge. It will rapidly expand as you uh, get involved in all the nuances of transformation. So I know that was quick, and I wanted to give you a, just a global overview about how to think about course transformation. I encourage you to go to the NCAT site. Uh, in your spare time, because I know all of you have lots of spare time. But the NCAT site, um, this provides so many resources, likely including answers to questions you might have. Um, if the redesign works to improve student learning, um, then it's worthwhile. If it doesn't, um, then it was worthwhile finding out why. In any event, um, I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions. Well, Eddie, I think you were pretty thorough because I certainly don't have any questions. All the ones that I thought I might ask and appear brilliant, I didn't mean to ask because you <laughs> answered them. But um, definitely this is a work in progress here at Chico State, and we're learning a lot as we go, and hopefully by the time we're in our fourth or fifth year of this, we'll have it down pat. Um, but we're making great strides here at the university. And I think I'm, we are. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to this summer teams okay. coming in and um, the courses that we're going to work with uh, will improve the students' academics here at the university. That's our goal. So I want to thank you so much for coming in today and taking your time and uh, explaining this very, very important aspect I'm of glad to do it. course transformation. All right, okay. thanks. Thank you, Eddie. Okay.